It is October 1562. Queen Elizabeth has lain unconscious in a coma for the last 24 hours. Her physicians have diagnosed smallpox and she is not expected to live. In a nearby room, the Privy Council is in crisis. It is three years into the reign but Elizabeth has neither married nor named a successor. If she dies, there will be a constitutional crisis, possibly a civil war. And a new threat was waiting in the wings. On the 19th of August, 1561, a tall, striking-looking woman stepped ashore at Leith, near Edinburgh. It was Mary, Queen of Scots, returning to her kingdom. There was a thick sea mist that morning. Some later saw this as an evil omen of the sorrow, the darkness and the impiety which Mary's return was to bring to Scotland. The 18-year-old Queen of Scots had been brought up in France and she'd not seen Scotland for 13 years. But even when she was back in Scotland, her sights were set on another, greater kingdom, England. The Catholic Mary was Elizabeth's cousin and had a very strong claim to the English throne. She posed a double threat to Elizabeth. Protestantism was only recently established and still vulnerable. And with Elizabeth unmarried, childless, and in poor health, the succession was dangerously open. But Elizabeth recovered, and for the moment, the crisis was over. Her first words on regaining consciousness were to command her council to appoint a Lord Protector in the event of her death. His salary, she specified, would be a staggering £20,000, more than was spent on the coronation. The man she named was Robert Dudley. The scandal of his wife's death had died away and Dudley's reputation had recovered. Now he was back in favour in spectacular style. Only three months after her illness, Elizabeth faced a fresh ordeal. Parliament had been summoned for January 1563, and everybody knew that a reluctant queen would be forced once more to confront the issue of the succession. The Parliament was opened with a sermon preached in Westminster Abbey by Alexander Noel, the Dean of St Paul's. And Noel put into words what most people only dared think. All the Queen's most noble ancestors have commonly had some issue to succeed them, but Her Majesty yet none. The want of your marriage and issue is likely to prove a plague. If your parents had been of your mind, where had you been then? Alack, what shall become of us? Now, I reckon that's pretty straight talking. It was a very small part of the sermon, but this, if you like, was almost before a state opening of Parliament. Now, I don't know if Dean Noel had been put up to it by Elizabeth's political advisers, or whether he was just speaking for himself, but I do think he was taking a bit of a risk. Noel would not have been the first churchman to be sent to the Tower. He'd had a bit of a run-in at St Paul's the year before, when he'd given her a prayer book, you know, with pictures of saints, and she took exception to this. This was a kind of idolatry that she'd forbidden. So he was playing with fire a bit, but clearly he was prepared to nail his colours to this particular mast. Noel's tough words set the tone for the Parliament. 
but again, the Queen hedged and obfuscated. For her, marriage was simply not on the cards. Mary, though, showed no such reluctance and was entertaining the suits of several European Catholics. An alliance between Scotland and one of England's enemies could spell disaster. So Elizabeth requested diplomatic talks with the Scots. For nine days, she entertained Mary's ambassador, Sir James Melville. She desired to know of me whether my queen's hair or hers was best, and which of the two was fairest. I said she was the fairest queen in England, and mine the fairest queen in Scotland. She inquired which of them was of highest stature. I said, my queen. Then she is too high, saith she, for I myself am neither too high nor too low. There was a final round in this game of diplomacy. Elizabeth offered an English candidate for the hand of the Queen of Scots, Lord Robert Dudley. Her Majesty called him her brother and best friend, whom she could have married, had she ever minded to have taken a husband. But being determined to end her life in virginity, she wished that the Queen, her sister, might marry him. But did Elizabeth really intend to give the man that she'd loved to Mary, Queen of Scots? Well, Robert Dudley, who should have known, took her intention seriously enough to do everything that he could to scupper the scheme. But actually, there was a lot to be said for it politically. It would have solved the problem of what to do with Dudley. He wouldn't have become King of England, but he would have become King as consort of Mary, Queen of Scots. And it would have solved the problem of what to do with Mary. She'd have been safely married to an Englishman and so kept out of the clutches of a foreigner and the foreign alliance that the English so feared for their northern neighbour. And it would have solved the problem of the succession. There'd have been no difficulty about recognising the children of the marriage as heirs to the English throne. But the scheme did fail. Not because of Elizabeth, but because of Mary's contempt for the man that she called Elizabeth's horsekeeper. <laughs>